So um, I'll put them on up after class. So where were we last time? We were thinking about the idea of vector models. So representing objects, texts, words, whatever, as sequences of generally floating point numbers. And <clears throat> 
What I want to do today is just continue in that theme by thinking about uh, how you can um, consider a bag of words, synonymous with that term frequency model, and how you can think about uh, what does it mean, what are its advantages, and how can you view it? How can you do sort of exploratory analysis? And then how can you use it to do some task in NLP? And then we'll talk about why term frequency with its adjustments <coughs> like inverse document frequency may not be the best, may not be the best thing, may not be the best model. It's useful for certain tasks, classification that's been very successful. But um, uh, what's happened in recent years is the notion of embeddings, which we'll spend quite a bit of time on. I'm going to introduce them today, and we're going to come back to them uh, after we start on the machine learning part of the course. So just remember the basic idea for a term frequency model. What you're going to do is, say, have a um, the number of dimensions is equal to the number of terms or words, tokens, here they call them terms, are all sort of synonymous. And then you simply list the frequency occurrences in the vector, and that becomes a vector in a vector space in some number of dimensions. So um, if you'll see this vocabulary, the cardinality of these. <clears throat> and the words or the tokens are the axes, right, in three dimensions, x, y, and z. Here's for three different terms. But in general, uh, this is very highly dimensional. You have a lot of words. A lot of words. Shakespeare, 20,000. Uh, there's 300,000 words that are potentially usable. In English, most people only use you know, on the order of 30 or 40,000. But they're sparse. Come back to that. Now, <clears throat> we introduce this other idea, which is fundamental. And that is, there's two things we're going to do today. We're going to think about how to look at these vector, look at these vector models and what they might mean. Okay, and you're pretty much interested in when things are similar or different. Is something the same? Is it unrelated, orthogonal? Is it the opposite? And so, in a vector model like this, we have the following notion that is used pretty consistently throughout these these models of cosine similarity. Let me just remind you what it is. It is, if you think of this as the vector space, of course, we're in two dimensions. So this is one word, this is another word, and this is the count of word one, is the x dimension, y is the count of word two. Okay, generalize that to many more dimensions. You know, the vector in the vector space. It's got a length. The length is related to how many words, how long the document is, right? Um, not exactly the sum, it's the Euclidean distance. But that's not really what we want to know. I mean, it, it's interesting to know what the length is. That might be useful in some settings. But what we're more interested in is the percentage of the words in the vector. So if, um, if you say the car was fast, the car was fast, 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 maybe it's faster than the first one, right? And so you're interested in the percentage of words, car, car, fast, fast, not a very good sentence. It's really the same thing as saying car, fast. The car was fast, the car was fast, the car was fast. They really mean the same thing. You just repeated the information. So. Again, this is a model. All models are used, you know, are wrong in some sense. And you're eliminating certain things that you don't care about for the particular task you're doing. And if we're not that, mostly we're not, in, at least in this model, we're not interested in the number of words so much as the proportion. How many, it's not the length of the, of the movie review. 
it's what percentage of the words are negative, what percentage are positive. If you think of this as positive words, count the positive words, count the negative words, then this would be a good review, and this would be a bad review, and this would be somewhere in the middle. So it's the percentages. So that would motivate the idea that length doesn't really matter. So the cosine similarity, we went through this last time, it takes the unit vector. You have A divided by its norm, and uh, that's just uh, the unit vector of length 1. And B, do the same thing, normalize it, unit vector. And there's a calculation there using the dot product. But what that gives you is for two vectors, which come to you as sequences of floating point numbers, it gives you the cosine of the angle between them. Okay? Now, the cosine, if you think of this rotating around and creating a sine wave, uh, the cos when it's here, the cosine is 1. Then it's 0. Then it's negative 1. Then it's 0. Okay? So it's going to vary from negative 1 to 1. So this is a measure of how close two vectors are, ignoring their length. Okay, ignoring their length. Just the angle. We don't care how long they are. And so when two, when two uh, vectors are two uh, characters, two sentences, two whatever it is that you're modeling, when the cosine is, small, is, is close to one, okay, when the angle is small, if you think of this as zero degrees, that's I'm just, just the cosine itself. Zero degrees is cosine one, 90 degrees is cosine zero, 180, and so forth. Well, here we're just considering not, not from the x-axis, but the two together. So this is a small angle. The cosine is going to be close to one. And then when they're orthogonal, when they're unrelated, okay, what this means is that really there's no similarity between the vocabulary. Okay? And when they're orthogonal, then that means they're unrelated. Two unrelated texts would talk about completely different things. Say if you eliminated the stop words, because almost everything has stop words, the, uh, and so forth. Uh, they're about completely different subjects. Now, again, when you're counting the number of words, you don't have this phenomenon because you don't have negative numbers. But we're heading in territory where we're going to use the full generality of the vector space. And so if words are, you know, if somehow you count words as positive and negative, and maybe these two reviews, whatever they are, one is diametrically opposed. It says the opposite of what the other one says. And that would be negative one. So negative one is as opposite as could possibly be. Zero is unrelated. You don't, there's no comparison between one is essentially identical. And so if you think of the range from here to here, right, for for um, bag of words, in this one, the percentage of words is absolutely identical. Here, no. And in between, some words are the same, some words are not. The percentage, if you put the percentages next to each other, they're similar to some degree. That's the idea. So, here's what I did. I thought this would be sort of an interesting experiment. I'm not sure it worked out very well. And I want you to maybe give me some advice why it didn't work out so well. I took um, these, uh, let's see, eight, yeah, these eight characters from, uh, from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. And uh, you did uh, Elizabeth Swan and Jack Sparrow, but I did it for everybody else. So here are the 20 most common words from Will Turner, Gibbs. I haven't watched the movie in a while. I forget who Gibbs is. I don't know if he's a pirate or a non-pirate. Lord Cutler, not a pirate. Uh, here a pirate. Uh, obviously, Jack Sparrow spoke a whole lot more. He wants a lot of things. Uh, Will Turner, people talking to Jack. Uh, Elizabeth says will a lot. Um, the pirates say things like I, Maury. David Jones says ha a lot. Okay. 
So if you just look, huh, and um, if you look at these, you sort of get a sense if you look at the top, you know, most common words, sort of what they're about. You know, what are they talking about most of the time? So that's one, one way of thinking about this data. And here I calculated the cosine similarity between every pair of these eight. Now remember, higher cosine similarity means that that means that they're more similar. Low cosine similarity says they're very different or they're unrelated. So Davy Jones and Pintel, although they're both pirates, one of them says arg and the other one says ha and they say different things. So they're not very related because their vocabularies aren't very similar. But apparently Will Turner and Lisbeth Swan, I think they're the love interest in it, uh, they have a fair amount of similarity. And then somewhere in between, you know, Jack Sparrow and Lord Cutler, sort of fair to middle. So what I want to think about is how how you interpret these models and what you do with them, okay, once you have this data in the vector paradigm. So I think somebody asked me this question at the end of the last lecture, and, uh, and uh, I thought I it was sort of an interesting thing to try. Um, if we think of the angle between Elizabeth so we go back to here, and I just took everyone where Elizabeth was involved. Well, Elizabeth Swan, Will Turner, Elizabeth Swan, Ward Cutler, Elizabeth Swan, Jack Sparrow. If you just cut out, I think these are now, yeah, these are alphabetical left to right. So if you just take everyone that has Elizabeth in the first column, you have them in order, but let's visualize it. We want to understand what the data looks like. So here's a visualization of how similar people's lines are to the lines that Elizabeth Swan sees. Not very, it looks like, right? Uh, Pentel and Ragetti, the pirates, are as far, pretty far away, almost orthogonal, almost using a different vocabulary. Gibbs, I forget who he is. Interestingly, I mean, Will Turner is the closest. Well, they're the love interest. Very loving, but not that close. Anyway, uh, Jack Sparrow, the interesting thing, Jack Sparrow and Lord Cutler uh, are, are almost the same distance away. Not that they are that similar, but they are essentially the same distance away from Elizabeth. Right? One of them is Jack Sparrow is a 0.4493, and Lord Cutler is 0.4497. That corresponds to 63 degrees. Point two, so, you know, a difference of uh, three hundredths of a degree in this, you know, or in the cosine similarity uh, into, uh, uh, I guess, four thousandths of the, of, a, of the cosine. So there's actually two dots here, and you can't see them. So this is interesting. I'm not sure what to make of that in terms of the story. But uh, <coughs> I don't know. That's an interesting way to how are people related to one of the characters? But we also want to know the relationship of all of the characters, right? So what we'd like to do is somehow not just think about <coughs> their relationship to Elizabeth Swan, but all of their interrelationships. And I'm not sure this kind of diagram is really going to do that for you. So here's what we're going to do. Here's where we're headed. Let me skip ahead a little bit, and I'm going to show you something. And I'm going to come back and explain where we get it. What we're interested in doing is coming up with a display, okay, for, for looking at and for evaluating, for interpreting, maybe thinking about the data in, in terms of which each one of these characters we can see their relationship to each other. Now, I will tell you, I've destroyed the cosine similarity metric here. It doesn't, it doesn't survive the process I'm about to just describe. 
But what we're looking for is a model that tells us in the vector space, Regetia can tell as pirates are pretty close to each other. Um, Lord Cutler Beckett is off by himself. Jack, Jack Sparrow, Davy Jones, Regetti and Pintel, the pirates, are all kind of near each other. Yes. Uh, oh, I'm getting there. Hold on. <laughs> it's not as simple. Yeah. Hold on. But I'm just motivating what I'm about to do. Okay? So, huh, that's interesting that Elizabeth Swan and Will are really pretty far apart. But all the pirates are near each other. Okay. So this is a tool, and now I'm going to explain how it works. And the answer is not very satisfying, <laughs> if you want to answer to that. So the total vocabulary size, if we want to visualize the characters in this movie in a vector space to figure out from their words how similar are they just in terms of their words, then the this is a vector uh, of 1,249 words. I've combined all of the words from all of the speeches okay, without everything. Didn't delete any stop words. Took the set of this is unique words. So the vocabulary here is 1,249 words spoken by those eight characters. So when you have somebody in this vector space, it's taking place in 1,249 dimensions. Good luck visualizing that, unless you have a different brain than I have. You know, and you know, when we, we, <coughs> when we do, uh, we teach 132, we have these high dimensional spaces. We always show you examples in two and three dimensions, because you can do more than three dimensions. So, but keep in track of the fact that these, you know, these vectors take place in this kind of physical space in some sense. Um, it's just impo it's impossible for me to get any intuition from Probably for you. So there's a number of different ways to view the data in a way that is more comprehensible. It's not just a trick. It's not just fooling around and looking at cool diagrams. It actually is a useful technique. There's a number of different ways. So <clears throat> the most there's a couple of them, but the, the most useful, maybe the most uh, broadest one, is called principal component analysis. If you took uh, 132 with Mark Cravella, maybe with me, uh, we did this at the end of the class. It's, it's always the way in these classes. It's going to be the way in this one. At the end of the semester, when everybody's exhausted, we want to give the most important stuff. Right? So, give me one second. Uh, so, principal component analysis is, well, let me take your question. Wait, the one with the uh, the, the arrows? No, the one where I was here. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, did you see that the angle between the Yeah. Let me get there. I, <laughs> I know you're asking great questions, but there's a reason why. <coughs> so here's the. It's called principal components analysis. It's you're basically going to take the term frequency matrix. So here are the documents. In our setting, these are characters, right? eight characters, eight rows. There's going to be 1,249 words, so 1,249 dimensions. Now, this is a technique in linear algebra where you factor a matrix, and you factor it into uh, three different matrices, but basically the second and third, if you multiply them together, are the eigenvectors. Okay? So what are the eigenvectors? The eigenvectors are, the, in some sense, the, the, the vectors which show you um, that sort of where the principal uh, variance is in the data. So, and the scale of it, how roughly, roughly, roughly corresponding to the variance, is uh, the eigenvector, the eigenvalue. Uh, so these are the 
principal components of the data, meaning the most important directions in the data. I'm going to show you just an example in a moment. Illustration. And there's a technique for doing this. Uh, it's fairly efficient unless you're, you have a huge matrix. And here's what it does. It tells you which <coughs> dimensions, but dimensions really being vectors, you're readjusting the, the axes in some sense. And then you're going to project on some of the axes and ignore the others. So let's look at the example. Go back to 132 notes if you want the detail. So suppose this is in, and this is a dimensionality reduction technique. And with principal components analysis, the example we gave in uh, 132 is that these give you the strength of the vectors, and you can order them, and then you can just cut the less important ones out, the ones that are close to zero. You save the most important ones. And this can be done, for example, with images. And you can take an image and reduce its size. It's a compression technique. Fewer, less data, preserving as much of the characteristic of the image as possible. But you can do it for any matrix. And we have a matrix. So let me just show in two dimensions. Say, you know, I know it's in the wrong quadrant, but this is the count of two different words or O positive words and negative words or something. Two-dimensional data. And you have a bunch of points here. Those are documents. Now, <clears throat> if you wanted to cut out, we wanted to reduce the dimensionality from two to one. And what you could do is just project it. Just delete one of the dimensions. But that doesn't actually capture the most important things about the data. The shape of the data is what's important here. The fact that there's some kind of information going on right here, which shows you some kind of relationship between the positive and negative words. And that's what you do in a different setting with regression. If this is here, you might try to find a, well, you can do it here as well. Uh, find a line which somehow gives you the minimum error and it, you know, it shows you sort of the trend of the data. So we're doing the same thing here. <clears throat> if you, you shift it, you, you subtract the mean, so you get it centered in the vector space. And then these are the eigenvectors. These are the principal components which give us the way that the data is arranged, how it varies in this dimension, not as much, how it varies in this dimension, a lot more. Which one is more significant? This one. That preserves as much information as possible. <clears throat> the distance on this vector, this eigenvector, isn't as important as the distance here. It bears an interesting relation to uh, axes of rotations. If you have an oblong object, it's easier to rotate it, you know, in, along certain lines than other lines. And this corresponds to essentially the blob. It will be harder to rotate it this way than to rotate it this way. There's more mass. But this is information. So <clears throat> we, we can simply, simply, <laughs> Delete as many of the lower, smaller eigenvectors that we want. In this case, well, if we're going to reduce this from two dimensions, okay, to one, then what we're going to do is eliminate this dimension, as it were. It's not a dimension, it's an eigenvector. But you see the idea. We could have taken this and rotated it so that it is, you know, this is the y-axis and this is the x-axis, and then we'd be projecting. But essentially now we're just projecting onto this eigenvector. And what you get from this data, you get this line with the points right here. Every one of these points has been projected onto this line. So what is that doing? It is essentially taking your data in however many dimensions and reducing 
to dimension and preserving as much of the data as information as possible, you are losing information. Absolutely. This has a great deal more information than the points on this slide. But for our task, it may not matter. Okay, now we can answer these questions. So here's what I did. I did just ran the code from SK Learn actually. And uh, <coughs> I took a fifth, oh, eight, I'm sorry, eight. Eight by 1,249 matrix, and I reduced it to a eight by two. Okay? Eight points, the rows are the individuals, uh, the two is the X and Y dimensions. So, what is the answer to your question now? What do the axes mean? I have no idea. Because they don't correspond to any of the original, they don't correspond to any, strictly speaking, they don't correspond to any of the original words. In some sense, they correspond to the major groupings of words that make people look similar. But it's very hard to see what they actually mean. They are the major characteristics of the data. When you look at this example, what does this data mean? Well, it's the distance, it's the distance from the mean along the axis which has the most variance, which is somehow has the most information. But it's not, but that's a, that's a relationship between, say, positive and negative words. So there's some kind of relationship between the words which somehow is captured by these eigenvectors. That's about the best I can do, unless you have a better idea. <laughs> They're all screwed up now. Lost. Yeah, it's lost. Um, but but uh, it means something. I mean, uh, I, I'd say I'd say that the more important thing is uh, their closeness. Remember, you do the cosine similarity in the full vector space. This is just a way of viewing the information and in which you sort of preserve the two most important things about this data. Groups of words or relationships between words. It's really hard to be specific. It's the two, well, there'll always be two that are. But if you have the moving. You mean they're all identical? Well, you could. You, but you could do this in three dimensions. You can do it in one dimension. But any number of dimensions you want, right? But what does it mean? You're collapsing dimensions down. And the way this technique works is it's very hard to recover from that what exactly it means. Now, there's a technique called latent semantic analysis, which does something sort of similar. Um, and it's a little more obvious that what you're doing is combining words together. I'm not going to talk about it. So is the process of getting to this collapsed dimensional representation, this PD representation, a series of like <coughs> n minus two projections? So no, 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 not really. That's a, that's that's a that's an approximation. But so you've got to recenter. It's 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 really not the dimensions. You're you're kind of reorienting it around the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors now become the dimensions. And, and it, okay, if you adjust it so that the eigenvectors become the, become the, new, di, the new axes, mm -hmm. then you could think of it as, as projecting, just eliminate the two of them. Yeah. If that's what you're thinking. But this is a complicated notion, right? And I, it's, we're, what we're going to see is that in these vector models, they do these kinds of representations. Uh, in this case, uh, I think you could say basically that if something like Euclidean distance might be a little more, I don't know, what do you think? It might be a little better metric than the angle. I'm not sure how to interpret the angle. It's some 
I don't think it's unrelated to the, to the I, but I don't see any comparison between this, for example, and the one I had. And I, anyway, uh, so, but here's now the thing I want to add. <laughs> um, this was using raw frequency counts. I just counted the number of words. I didn't remove the stop <coughs> Let's do that. And I'm not going to draw these arrows anymore, but you're going to see it's the same thing. But now, before I did the modeling, before I did it, and I didn't count the number of words, but I've eliminated probably 100 words. I don't know how many words are in this stop. In SK Learn, they have their own stop words. So if you eliminate this one, remember what this one is doing. It's counting all the words that people speak, including things like and, uh, the, is, stuff like that, right? And so maybe that's noise. It's not clear that, well, maybe pirates don't use such nice things as the and uh. They just say are, things like that. But um, in this case, you know, the pirates are near each other. But maybe it's because they don't use stop words. I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, but now I eliminated the stop words. Okay. Um, Raggedy and Pintel are still near each other, still near Davy Jones and Jack Sparrow. But now Will and, you know, now they're closer. And Elizabeth, is she talking a lot more? I don't know. Not using, using a lot of fancy words. Okay, let's, let's try another one. Let's try the uh, term frequency in the first document frequency. Remember how that works. You have term frequency. And then you have the inverse document frequency. Inverse document frequency. And you use the log of it to make it scale a little different. So the inverse document frequency means oh, it's, a, it's kind of a so the substitution or maybe a better way of doing stop words, but it basically says that words are, that are not, that are used in relatively few documents are important. And that might make R really important because it's in relatively few documents. Only the pirates. So if you do that, you get this. Okay. Uh, Now, everybody but the two, these, these characters hardly said anything, and it was mostly R. You know? Or hang them, or something, you know? But then all these people are now near each other, and Elizabeth Swan and Will Turner and Lord Cutler Beckett are right near each other. I, so this is using the document, inverse document frequency, without stop words. But you can also do both, and often people do both, even though stop words are kind of a different way of thinking about inverse document frequency. Well, maybe that's good. The stop words are words that really don't, the, a, is. They don't, re everybody uses them, so they don't mean that much. You can remove those as well, and then do inverse document frequency. Now you get this. You have four different views of this data. Now, in this one, Jack Sparrow's way off by himself. Raggedy and Pintel stay near each other most of the time. Maybe jump. The pirates are down here. I always look to see whether Elizabeth Swan and Will are near each other. Lord Cutler Beckett and Elizabeth Swan, maybe they're both proper English people and they say the same thing. One tries to find meaning in this, but, you know, it's a little unclear. Can anyone suggest why there might be so much variation in this? I don't know how to interpret this. I've been suggesting fun things, you know, about origins. But why? 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 There isn't a lot of consistency. And it's always the same answer. There isn't a lot of data. 
It's a very short document. Pintel and and, uh, and uh, Reggetti speak a total of you know 20 or 30 words. When you don't have a lot of data, there's you know it's really hard to find these patterns. And remember that what we're really trying to model in this class, some sense, I keep saying this, is the infinite list of all the possible things that can tell was said, the infinite list of all the things that were getting in all of these. And then somehow you sample. You have a huge database of what each one of these people say, you know. And, and then you have a tremendous amount of data, and then the patterns are going to emerge. It's like in statistics when you take a sample. So I sample one person. Do you have a tattoo? No. Oh, I guess nobody in the class has a tattoo. That's not a very good sample. Take maybe 30, ask maybe 30, and then I have a certain probability of getting the right answer. Um, the more data, the better. And the data here isn't very good. But I wanted to show this example to make that point, but also because maybe it's a little simpler, you know, to just deal with something we already dealt with. So, slightly different example. Um, and actually we used this, we showed this in 132. Um, from SKLearn, uh, we're going to use a different system when we do our deep learning, but uh, there's some bunch of data sets. This is all, it's when they call them news groups. It's social media. <laughs> And uh, there's, they collected together all these messages in news groups, one about space, baseball, uh, people complaining about windows. Uh, there's also like religion, literature, travel, blah, 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 a whole bunch of them. And so I don't know how many documents, actually, I have to say. But <clears throat> if we do the exact same thing that I just did, and this one is using uh, term frequency in TV IDF with soft words for math. Maybe we think of that as the gold standard. Uh, it removes all the common words, which don't tell you much. And then it, it, given that you've done that, it tells you that words that are used relatively less often are more meaningful, according to this model. And then we reduce it to two dimensions. Now this was, oh, I think it was, I don't, I think it was like 50,000 words. It was like 50, something like that, or 29,000. Something like 50,000 different words, even after well, stop words only removed about 100. So, <clears throat> now this has been reduced to two dimensions. I have no idea what these mean. Right? Uh, but, 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 you've got a heck of a lot of data, and if you draw them depending on which, depending on which corpus it came from, or which, you know, say like this corpus, they look pretty different. They collect around zero. Okay. Um, but each of them has a shape, you know, this kind of oblong shape, which means that their vocabulary goes in a different direction. Now remember, one of the things, and I guess this is something we could keep in mind, is we're not doing cosine similarity here. The angles are not the important thing. But the dimension how far away from the center is related to, not exactly equal to, how large the documents are. I, I didn't really think about it. Is that true here? Let's see. So here, no, that doesn't look right, because Lord Cutler doesn't speak a lot. Hmm. Well, he's normally on the outside. <laughs> now, I, it's hard to make that comparison, but... Um, in any case, so here we see that we have a ton of data. We can really see some differences. There are going to be documents, messages that 
you know, don't differ that much from all the others. But then they have these different trends because they really have very different vocabularies. And you can do a pretty good job of classifying, right? All right, this is saying that the data is classifiable, that in some sense there are real differences between these messages. And I couldn't say that. It was really hard to say that. If we take, if we take our, our gold standard as TDIDF <coughs> and stop words, some people do, they would say that this is the best one. Uh, does this mean Jack talks a lot because he's far away? Is this related to... No, no, because Pintel and Rigetti hardly say anything. It's not exactly... It's not simple to come up with exact meanings for the dimensions and the angles or anything. Except that when people are close to each other, somehow they've stayed close through this dimension out. They're closer than the others. Relatively close. So in the next assignment, um, we're going to start to talk next time, on Thursday, about classification. And I want you to think about this, you know, that some data is classifiable, some data is not. If you wanted to classify the characters uh, in that script, you just might not have enough data. When you have a lot of data, it becomes easier. Every model gets better when you have more data. So just keep this in mind. Some data does, does separate into various categories. And we're going to talk about that next time. We'll talk about methods for classifying. Okay. Um, what's wrong with term frequency vector model? A bag of words. What's wrong with yeah, it's old school. We always start with it because it gives you a lot of intuitions about where we're going. It's not, it's not I wouldn't say useless by any means. It's, it still worked very well for classification. Oh, in 10 years, we may find that it's useless. But it's still a very useful concept. It's a simple idea. And by no means is it uh, useless. And by the way, what's our model for uh, the current assignment? Bag of words, it's string. Words are string. They have no meaning whatsoever. There's no way to deal with them except by an analyzing their probabilities in the, in the corpus. And that's what we're doing. I mean, I should have emphasized that. Bag of words, the words are just strings. And that's probably the least informative representation. And it's all this top-down analysis of what, you know, these, they, could be, they could be numbers. They don't have to be words, right? You can just associate them with numbers and forget about the, the words. And that's not, going forward, that's not useful, as useful. So essentially, in the bag of words model, words are numbers. They're different, you know, they're the same or they're not. Uh, in fact, they're less informative than numbers because they don't really have a scale that's useful. So then we have term frequency vectors. And that seems to be more useful because look at what you can do with it. There are differences. There's real ways that this information can be used. However, 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 there are... Uh, Lots of reasons why they may not be the state of the art anymore. Maybe they were 20 years ago. The first thing is they're very inefficient. Uh, if, if you have a very, very large corpus and you include all the other abbreviations and hundreds of thousands of words, um, for Chinese, how many characters are. If you took uh, a large corpus in China. How many, how many steps? Would it be hundreds of thousands? More? Anybody know? I <laughs> Just large number. Uh, I can tell you Sanskrit has an enormous number of words in it. It's a huge vocabulary. Uh, ancient Greek, you know, there's a, dic a dictionary home. It, it, there's an, even, even for a static language like ancient Greek, there's an enormous number of words. So this is 
This is a problem because you, every freaking word is a vector of 100,000 long. Instead of a number or a string of characters, you have 100,000 numbers. And most of them are completely uninformative because there's zeros. Bars. Okay, so you represent it as a dictionary. But still, huh, uh, when you input that into a neural network, you've got to expand it out. Okay? When you in, let me repeat this. When you do cosine similarity, you can have two dictionaries. We're using dictionaries for sparse matrices, right? Um, but if you have and you do cosine similarity, you just need to look at the intersection because you're going to multiply them together, take pro the dot product, and words that are in, not in the, in the intersection are zero. So all you really need to do is take the intersection of the two dictionaries and use that to do the dot product. But for a neural network, that doesn't work. And so a neural network which uses term frequency vectors, your input layer has to have as many neurons as, as, the, uh, as the vector. And yeah, I mean, we our computers are big and fast. But it's not, it's not efficient. It doesn't scale. Um, it's, it's mostly zero. I mean, it's just, you know, sort of unsatisfying from a computer science point of view. Um, you also don't generalize. They're built on one corpus. And yes, if I add documents to it, I can, or take doc, you know, you have, in our current time, we have the training set and the testing set. And yeah, we, but it's a considerable problem to get it to work on the testing set. We had to do this stupid back off thing. Because you have this problem that there's information that is, that is in the testing set that's not in the training set. So there's an example where a naive method like what we have, this list of words, doesn't generalize. You have to do this complicated thing and make maybe arbitrary assumptions about words that occur in the training set and that don't occur in the testing set. And that's it's unsatisfying. Uh, and, you know, across tasks, you design a bag of words or a frequency, term frequency model for a particular task and classification. Now you want to use it for generation. Well, it may not. It doesn't generalize. And you can't, like transfer learning, which we'll talk about later, you can't build some system and then have people add on to it to, you know, to use the information. You can get pre-trained models, right? And then you can add on to them. But you can't do that to these. They're too tied into their original model. But the main problem is that they really don't tell you about the semantics. Semantics is not the same as statistics, at least as you can use it. Uh, you don't really have a sense of what words mean. Uh, what words, and, and every word is, remember, we took, we took out the ordering. We removed all the ordering. So there's no ordering. So you can't tell what words occur next to each other. You can't tell whether, um, you know, big sister and tall sister and large sister mean different things or same or, you know, I mean, you can't make subtle distinctions because you can't tell what words occur next to each other and words occur together because they work together in a language based on their meaning, on their semantics. So how are the words used? What words do they occur with? What do the words even mean? There's no sense of this at all in a vector model. It's just these raw statistics about, well, this word occurred in this document and occurred in this document at about the same percentage. So maybe they have the same relationship to this word, but it has nothing to do with what the word means. It's sort of top down, and it's not, it's not enough specificity about meaning. So therefore, it's not surprising. It can't handle any kind of complex linguistic phenomenon. Okay. Uh, car and automobile. Maybe automobile sounds a little different than car. It's a little old-fashioned. There's a different connotation. But the denotation is the same thing. 
But the car and the automobile were the same thing. There were differences. But a vector model can't figure that out because car is here in the bag of words, and automobile is over here, and never between shall meet. There's no relationship between the two words. All you can tell is that maybe some document that talks about cars also talks about automobiles. But if you take one document that talks about cars and you replace every use of the word car with automobile, you've destroyed the connection. Whereas, you should, I'll show you an example. I mean, we're going to use this example in a minute. You should be able to substitute, but it, they don't have any relation. So synonyms don't, or antonyms, words that mean the opposite. All of these things are obscure. They're not there. And then there's polysemy, polysemantic, so many meaning. For example, an extreme example, sound. It means an audio signal, a sound. It means I am sound of body. It means the sound, I'm going to go to the sound and go fishing. It can mean I'm going to sound you out on whether you like this topic. It can mean, it has 19 different mean, meanings as a verb. It has 12 different meanings, distinct, completely distinct, but as adjectives. 12 different meanings as verbs. It's a noun and a verb at the same time, for God's sake. So, uh, that, in this case, you have two words that are different, which should be the same, and now you have one word, which should be different. So it screws everything up. So, it's a, it's a blunt force, uh, blunt instrument for doing the kind of things you want to do. Okay, what would be better? Well, the first thing is, let's start with the top. Let's not make them large and let's not make them sparse. We want short, dense vectors. Okay? Just right off the top, right? We want short vectors that are dense, that don't have a lot of zeros. Thinking in terms of the vector space, the zeros mean you're in a much lower dimensional space because you're using relatively few of the dimensions for the meaning. Um, if you have short, dense vectors, they're in some sense taking advantage of all those dimensions. And this is all very abstract until we start talking about half the building. But what we're looking for is something maybe 50 to 1,000 dimensions. Uh, typical use would be like 300. It's a typical number of people use, maybe 500. 50 is too small. Uh, dense, you don't have a lot of zeros. They're all being used, right? You're using all the dimensionality. You're spreading the, the words out and making full use of the, say, 300 dimensions. Um, right away, they're more efficient to use because now you only have, say, 300, and so your input layer is 300. Now, remember, when you have an input layer which is 10,000 or 100,000, you've got... 100,000 sets of parameters that you've got to assume, right? So now when you've shrunk it, it's smaller, but it's more efficient. You don't have as many parameters you've got to assume. Those zeros have to be dealt with. They may not have any information in them, but the neural network has to deal with them. So right away, you know, you can see we're heading towards neural networks here. Uh, they're more efficient. As, as inputs to machine learning systems. They also generalize better, and this is a little vague at this point, but we'll see. Um, if you're collapsing down the number of dimensions, um, you can basically get more meaning into the vectors and they'll generalize better. That's a little hard to see yet. Uh, again, words which mean the same, if we can somehow embed meaning, uh, synonymy might work better we might be able to do more advanced linguistic things. So what we want to do is have short vectors. And this is just an introduction to the idea of embedding. We're going to come back to it because it's actually something that you do in machine learning. You learn the embedding. But we haven't gotten to the deep learning part yet, so I'm not going to give you those details. But I wanted to present it 
as part of the idea of these vector spaces, because that's the foundation for everything in NLP. So, here's what we could do, and this is, people have tried this, it's not, a, it's not a new idea. People have wanted to formalize language using numbers, using vectors for a long time. So, you know, in the 50s, for example, uh, people who, linguists who studied meaning uh, would try to come up with a set of classifications, a set of characteristics that they could measure on some kind of scale. And this one from Osgood, uh, I've never heard of before getting ready for this lecture, uh, he said there were three effective dimensions. There was the balance, how pleasant the word was, put it on a scale from zero to one. Arousal, how intense was the emotion, zero to one. Dominance, the degree of control exerted. Now he figured that these three were the most important three. I don't get it, but that's, that was his theory. And then he used human subjects, and everybody was supposed to rate words based on these three numbers. And so, for balance, love was 1.0. For dominance, leadership was 0.98. Uh, so, for dominance, weak was 0.045. <laughs> uh, arousal, if you're mellow, 0.069. But if you're elated, it's 0.9. You, you get the idea. And then, I don't want to give you... There. Yeah. I mean, we had exactly this kind of situation where three different parameters, every word was in that space of three dimensions. Balance, arousal, and dominance. Okay. He used it for some purposes. Um, I wished him, wish him well. I guess he's not around anymore. Um, and then people came up with other ideas. Now, let's, let's, instead of three, let's have a hundred. But this is some kind of rule-based system. You come up with a hundred different characteristics for words, and then I take all of you in uh, human subjects, and we all rate them. But this is, a, this is imposing order on the language instead of having the language tell us what it means. This is not how people learn words, right? It's not how you read. It's not how you react to information. This may put words like, you know, powerful and weak at opposite. They may, you know, have a cosine similarity of negative one. Uh, leader, follower, those may be opposite. Uh, leader, dictator, those are going to be near each other. Yeah, you, you can get some stuff out of it. But it doesn't, from lots of words, it's like, what about nouns? Car. What's your valence of car? Kind of depends on how you feel about cars, doesn't it? Uh, arousal. Uh, tuna. Does tuna arouse you? Well, I... It's so subjective. It doesn't really work very well. So this, this was an idea to put words in a vector space, but it didn't work very well. So, embeddings, which are the state of the art, all modern systems that you will use for the rest of the semester, I guess. Uh, well, we'll do one more assignment. Um, but the state of the art is using what's called embeddings. Now, an embedding is simply the term means you're taking a word and you're putting it into a vector space. In some sense, these were all embeddings. But embedding means a specific thing, and there's a couple of different strategies for doing this. Uh, one of us, is, this is kind of the odd man out, uh, singular value decomposition, like latent semantic analysis takes, uh, I don't want to go into it. Um, but the ones that we're going to be most interested in, there's a couple of them, like word to vec, and I'm going to talk about skip grams and just give you the idea from that. Um, glove, word to vec. Um, and there are, all, there's a lot of different ways of approaching this L1 bird contextual embedding and so forth. Um, lots of research on this in the last 10, 20 years. And I just want to give you some sense for how this works. And then we're going to come back to it. I want to put it in the context of these vector models. So, let's 
let's think about something. Um, what does a what does a mean? What does a word mean? How do you determine without a dictionary and without uh, we have linguists in the audience? Um, what, do you, what does a word mean? You might, if you're learning a foreign language, you might look up in a dictionary. But when you learned your language, or if you just moved to some country or you just read and you are learning words without a dictionary, how do you learn them? By seeing them in context. You would learn that automobile and car mean the same thing because you notice that they tend to be used in exactly the same place, right? The fast car was speeding down the road. The fast automobile was speeding down the road. You would notice just by seeing the words in context that car and automobile tend to be used in very, very similar contexts. That's how we learn. I've, I've learned a couple of different languages, not well, but I get tired of looking things up in a dictionary. And after a while, you just, just read and you figure you see some word in French or something. You get five or six times and you get a sense for it. That's how babies learn. That's how we all learned our native languages. When you learn languages uh, you know, in school in a systematic way, you'll memorize vocabulary lists or something. But that's not how we learn. So this has been thought about for a long time. Wittgenstein, a famous philosopher, said the meaning of a word is its use in the language. Now this is a very important idea because its use in the language means as syntax. The meaning is not something in your head, it's all the places where it's used. In ancient Greek, uh, there are words that nobody knows exactly what they mean, but they're, they have five different contexts well, it must be some kind of pot with a handle. <laughs> they just figure out how it's used, what the meaning is. They can't ask the ancient Greeks what it meant. In the modern era, this has been called distributional semantics. The first guy, the linguist in 1959, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Words are defined by the words around them. So, as I said, car, the fast blank was speeding down the road. The fast blank was speeding down the road. How many things could you say there? Car, automobile, bike, dog. But you get the idea. If you looked at every place that car was used, you'd get a sense for what it means. Right. So, ang choi, it's a borrowing. Chinese. Uh, suppose you see the sign. You don't know what it means. That's what it means. You don't know what it means. Ang choy is delicious, sautéed with garlic. Sautéed with garlic. Okay. Ang choy is superb over rice. Well, you're, okay. Ang choy leaves. Ah, oh, it has leaves. You, know. <laughs> you start to get a picture for what this is. Spinach sautéed with garlic over rice. Okay. Charred stems and leaves are delicious collard greens and other salty, leafy greens. Now you're getting the feeling that, you know, ang choy may be something like spinach. It's a leafy green like spinach chard or collard greens. If you see a bunch of examples, these should be near each other in the vector space. Okay? So the context of leaves, delicious, sautéed, gives some meaning to this, this word that we didn't know, say. So what we'll do is, and I'm not going to be real specific here, we're going to come back to it, just give you a feel for it. Um, each, each word is a vector, of course. Similar words are nearby in semantic space because they have the same context. And we build the space automatically by seeing which words are nearby. And by doing that, you see that Two by you know certain words are going to be near each other. They tend to have the same words around them. It's like incredibly bad, bad words, words, not good. Right? These words tend to be used in the same places with movies and food and so forth. How would we actually do that? Well, it's a variation of what you're doing in the second, uh, third assignment. In that assignment, you have n-gram. What's an n-gram? It is some left context 
And then the final word in that last generative model is we're simulating the idea, which is why I wanted to change the model for part two as well. Like if I'm speaking, I decide what word is next, and I'm going from left to right. I don't think of the last word and goes in reverse. We all do that. We think sequentially all the time. So that model is saying, OK, I'm going to base the word that's chosen on its left context. For an n-gram, it's a word with three words before it. For a five-gram, it's a word with one word. But that's its left context. Ah, but it's also the right context, which gives meaning. Even if I'm not predicting right now what word I'm going to say next, by the time I've said it, the whole thing hangs together in a way that has context on both sides. You could say that the left context more important than the right context. Well, we don't do that because we're embedded. So here's the very simple idea. It's called a skip gram. You just take plus or minus some number of words on each side. Now, it occurred to me that that might be an interesting way to evaluate complexity, maybe a better way. What do you think? Instead of just saying, take the probability of the next word following, go through and take a word, take something like a five-word skip gram, two words of left context, two words of right context, and a blank, a hole. Instead of having two words for a trigram, it's two words of left context and a hole. What word follows this? We'll pick a likely one. But instead, this can't be used so easily for generation, right? Because you have to go left to right. But after you have a sentence, you could build a skip gram, which says, if some of you had enough data, let me look at all five word sequences, and what is the probability that a particular word ends up in the middle of those five words? And that would be a way of assessing its probability maybe in a better way than just going left to right, because it also takes account of what follows. As I say, it's not so good for generative models. So word, in more general terms here, is defined by all the skip grams in the corpus. And what they do is, and I'm leaving a big hunk of this out, we'll get back to it, um, you can use between one to five on each side, typically. They don't use 30. It's too much. We don't have 30 grams, right? Quadrograms, pentagrams, are about as much as you can do. So you sort of do up to that on each side. And you're looking for, basically, the way that a, um, an embedding is made is a machine learning tech. You start with, with, with words randomly. <laughs> just so you just give them random embeddings. They're in random places. And then you start looking at the skip grams. And when two words have similar context, they tend to be used in the same skip frames. You move them closer in space. You learn that they should be closer. When words have different skip frames, you move them farther apart. And there's a learning process that goes on. We haven't talked about machine learning, so I don't want to go into But that's the basic idea. But what's really, really interesting about this, once you get this to work, it is, uh, it's amenable to various kinds of very interesting, first of all, you know, King and Prince are near each other, and car and automobile are near each other, and fast and speedy are near each other, you know, because they tend to be used with the same surrounding words. But you can also do analogical reasoning, because they're vectors. <laughs> they're vectors, so you could say, here's a vector for crate, and here's a vector for angle, apple. And uh, I'm sorry, no, uh, grape is to vine as apple is to what? Well, tree, right? So you take this vector, and it gives you the relationship between grape and vine. And you take, it's just, you literally add a vector. It's the simplest thing. And you take apple, and you add this vector to it, and you look for the closest word to it. Using what? Cosine similarity. And the closest word will be something like tree. You can do all kinds of interesting things with these semantic spaces. You know, the relationship between a man and a woman is this vector. 
sir and madam. Kind of similar relationship. You can do, you can find relationships between words because now words have meaning. Let me stop there. We're going to return to this. Uh, and it's fascinating. It's also very powerful because now you have semantics built into our text. So let me stop there. Did, did that work? Did it work? I've often thought that emojis are kind of interesting. So, you know, say a Twitter or whatever. You put an emoji on a text. That's a, that's a meaning to it. It's given by the rest of the... Right? So, it's kind of a word that depends on the entire rest of the text. You know, or maybe the last sentence, I don't know. It's a funny... It's a funny but i got to go quickly. But, but that's an interesting thought. Did you add late? Did you add late? No, okay. First come one. You say number one. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 I'm happy to do it, but I have to see it. Oh. And I have the original code. So. Yeah. 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 I don't have time to I've got to go meet some people. Uh, pretty much the answer. Tonight I'm going to make a video and then I'll put it on the portrait. Let's look at it. <laughs> Somebody's tried it, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, essentially, all of these dimensionality reduction methods are compression. What well, loss? Oh, I, I mean, like yeah. language itself is, it could be considered as a lossy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I don't know of any research on it, but I'm sure the general idea of compression is what we're often talking about. We're trying to compress a corpus into the words and the corpus into the space. So things come together when they're synonymous, they end up you know, in opposite directions when they're antonyms. Felicity uh, is, is, uh, is a little hard because basically you have a word that ends up in different places in the space. So I'm not sure what you mean by I thought I guess I was thinking synonyms, but you mean for felicity you want to do that? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So like, um, if you were doing more data compression, yeah. you know, had like these things, but then you uh, cut it down to six bits and like covered most of your information, like 95 percent. Right. Well, that would tell you like how good dimensionality is. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and it seems to me that like by using a, a word that has multiple regional planes, it's also already committed itself to uh, <laughs> being locked up. 
There's a joke in Latin in classics that every Latin word means something it's opposite and something it's same. <laughs> it, language is just so weird. But, but there is this, you have a, a marker, and then you have meaning, and, and it, it can, it can you know, have every possible relationship. Two words that are different mean the same thing. Word could be, you know, uh, and it changes over time. Well, I don't know the exact answer, but think about it. Wait, 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 which one? For, for the testing thing? Yeah. Uh, well, so that's where you have to use back on. Uh, right. In 2D, so, uh, like, we talked about, like, point 0.4, and we search it uh, recursively. But if the unigram is not present, then, like, it's a uniform distribution, like, we discussed in the class. What I would do, I, I put that in the description, but basically, if you come to a word in the testing set you have never seen before, the only information you have is uniform distribution over the entire corpus. Right. That's the best information you have. It's not ideal. Right. But this happens a lot. And you have a corpus and you have some unknown word, but you don't know the context. It, it really matters what the context is. So, like, all the words that we haven't seen, so it will be the same property. Yeah. 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 You'll keep failing until you get to that unigram, and then you will just find the find the, the number of occurrences in the in the testing set because that's short, but then the whole number of words. Now it's the number of occurrences. I put that in the new description that I put up has a, a better description. But we have to subtract that from the other words ideally like if we want the information to be one because we are for the words that were not present in the corpus, we are giving them some state, even if it's minus, with some probability. So I think we should have to subtract the other words from the other words. I'm sorry, it's just like I, I think it would be confusing. Because if you're finding a word that is not well, inside the training corpus, but it's, it's inside of the whole corpus by itself, anyways. But if we. Let me get my. I have to get to. That's the split of the two parts the testing and the training corpus. Okay. And a word which is testing, yeah, not in training. So what you do is you count the whole corpus, both training and testing. Uh, in the real world, for example, if you, our model was stuck on this, like on this round corpus, and you find a word that is not a part of that round corpus, that is another kind of question. That's actually the question right But I feel like we should Thank you. 